Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We had a good time at uh, last night in town, and uh, so we thank everybody that came out to uh, celebrate the uh, light up the town. We had a place out there, and we uh, had a good time. Hot chocolate, passed out tracks, flyers, so that was a wonderful time. I, I, you know, I'm a little prejudiced here, but just a tiny bit. I'm being biased a little bit here, yeah. I was so proud of my grandkids last Amen. night. Amen. Yeah. They, they, they passed out tons of tracks. Yes, they did. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, and got, we had a lot of tracks, all those little car tracks. And they were out there last night just passing them out, along with the flyers for the youth. And uh, so uh, it was, it was, we had a very good time last night. So uh, thank you for those that have come out. And I'm looking forward to seeing... Uh, uh, how God's going to bless, Amen. and uh, we passed out a lot of flyers uh, to a lot of teens last night in town, so so praise the Lord, Amen. looking good. Ephesians chapter 2, continue to uh, look at our prayer list on the, web, on, on the internet, on your phones, because we have a lot of people that need much prayer. Uh, yesterday I saw John Rosa, he ended up in the hospital, uh, something, wrong, something happened with his heart, and uh, they're looking at the pacemaker he has, so keep him in prayer. He'll probably be there today and tomorrow, probably. So we'll see, what, we'll see what's going on. So keep them in prayer. Um, I got a text from Desense, and Lawrence has, uh, has some more tests that has to be done. So keep them in prayer. And the, the, the list just goes on. And, you know, people need liver transplants. And so uh, Satan is attacking this church uh, drastically in the physical realm. So uh, keep up, but we are a praying church, Amen. and it's exciting to see what God uh, can do. Amen? Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter two, <clears throat> verse eleven through thirteen. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this, this morning. We ask that thy Holy Spirit would, would uh, touch uh, our hearts. And as we uh, preach your word, Father, speak to us through it. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In order to understand verses 11 through 13, I have to build a background, cultural-wise, in order to understand these verses. So be patient with me this morning. Uh, as you look at these verses, you have to understand that the world in which Paul lived and wrote was, uh, on many levels, vastly different from our world today. Cultures, languages, way of life were very different back then than today. However, there is some glaring similarity between the world and, and the one that we call home today. For instance, their world was a world marked by barriers, and so are ours. There were social barriers back in Paul's day where walls were erected between masters and slaves. Today, it is, it is between employee and the employer relationship. There were financial barriers, rich on one side and the poor on the other side in Paul's day. Today, there are those who lack adequate resources and, and those people uh, are resentful of those who have a, enough. There's that barrier. There were barriers within family back in Paul's day. In the early church, it was not uncommon for a woman to be saved while her husband was lost. Strife in the home today still is common in our day today and in the church. In the church today, we have well, a relationship, marriage relationship, where one partner is lost and the other partner is saved. We have those types even today. Barriers divided the ancient world with regards to attitude 
of Greeks toward the rest of the world. Syrio said of the Greeks, as the Greeks say, all men are divided into two classes, Greeks and barbarians. That's how they looked at it back in Paul's day. Greeks believed they spoke the language of the gods. They looked down on everyone else. And we have those problems even today. Liberal elites. Huh? Liberal elites. Yep, the liberal elites. Yep. So when you look at these barriers, this is the culture which Paul was writing. This is the culture, culture which the Ephesians lived. When the gospel was presented, it came to all people without regard of their race. Amen? Their nationality, their ethnic social standing, or even their sex. The gospel would break down these walls between the religions of that day. That's why it was so difficult in preaching the gospel during Paul's day because of the, they had to break down all of this race, nationality, ethnic. All of that had to be broken down. And the only way that could be broken down was through the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we see here, look at, for instance, look at Romans chapter 1. We'll get to the verses in a minute. Romans chapter 1 went the wrong way. Romans chapter 1, and notice uh, verses 14 through 16. The Bible says here, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the what? Barbarian. See? See, see what Paul's saying here? There was a barrier there. Both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to what? The Greeks. So, see, see what Paul is saying here? Break down your barriers. The only way you're going to break down those ethnic, religious barriers is to get saved. The gospel can break down any barrier. Amen? Paul says, I preach the gospel to all classes of people. Look at Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3. I want you to notice verse 11. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11. Whether there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, centethan, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Amen? Amen? When a person gets saved, we're all one in Him. Amen? There's no nationality. There's no barriers. We are one in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So it's our responsibility not to bring up barriers anymore. Amen? Don't bring them up. Paul is writing, you remember, to the Ephesian church and to us also to let the church know that in Jesus the walls are all taken down. In other words, all born-again believers who come to worship every Sunday morning, there should be no walls, no barriers. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. We should be loving each other, helping each other. We're all equal here. But sometimes we tend to forget that. The walls are broken down. You see, in Jesus there is no master or slave, no male, no female, no rich, no poor, no Greek, no barbarian, no Jew or Gentile. In Christ we are all made one. Get used to it. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. In verse 11, Paul reminds us of the division of the past. We're going to see that. Reminds us of the wall between the Jews and us. In verse 12, Paul reminds us of the devastation of the past. He reminds us of just how bad the situation was outside the wall. We had five huge problems, Paul said. Ephesians, church, you have five big problems. Number one, we were without Christ. Amen? Problem number one. You see, if you're not saved this morning, you're not born again by the Spirit of God, you have a very big problem. You're not a child of God. Amen. You are without Christ in this world. 
Second problem, we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were also strangers from the covenant promise. We were without hope. We were without God. We were, on, in other words, we were all on the wrong side of the fence. Amen? Amen. And Paul is going to remind this church that. And then in verse 13, Paul reminds us of the destruction of the past. So let's look at this this morning. Let's notice number one, the power of this destruction. Verse 13 in our text. We were without who? Christ. Christ. Amen? We were without Christ. It's very important that you understand that. That we lived our life according to our flesh. flesh. Yeah, our flesh. Our old way of living. And so it's very, very important that we understand where we came from. Especially when he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you were sometimes were afar off, made nigh by the blood of Christ. In other words, afar off. In other words, we were shut out. Before you got saved, you were shut out of the presence of God. You were all alone in this world, desperate. You thought you knew God, but you really didn't. You only knew Him here, but not here. Shut out. Paul says, Ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh. As Gentiles, we, we were shut out. We were on the outside looking into the blessings of the Lord on His people Israel. When you understand the Old Testament, it was Jew and what? Gentile. That's it. And if it, us, we were Gentile. You, everyone in this room is a Gentile, unless you're Jewish. And in order for a Gentile to get saved, he had to go where? To find God. The nation of Israel. And if he wanted to get saved, then he had to believe in Jehovah God and make a sacrifice on the altar. Shed that lamb's blood. Amen. That's how you got saved back then. So all Gentiles were outside of God. We were outside the promises of Israel. Praise God. Jesus Christ broke down that wall. Amen. Shut out. On the ends, in the ends outside looking in. You see, we were lost without Christ. We were, in other words, we were in bad shape. We could not change our condition. And you can't, amen? Learn something this morning, people. Reformation doesn't change anything. We don't need to be reformed. We need to be reborn. Amen? amen? amen. Reformation won't get you nothing. I've said that over and over. How many times... Uh, uh, the world society, they think they can reform people and everything's going to be okay. So they go into some towns that looks like World War III hit it and they go in there and they build new houses and they build new this and they give them everything they want and, and then go back to that same place 10 years later, what happens? It looks like World War III hit it again. You know why? Because God says if the inside changes, the outside will change. If a person doesn't have a new heart in Jesus Christ, he's going to act and do the same thing he does all the time. Amen? Amen. We don't need reformation. We don't need to be reformed. You need to be reborn. When the heart changes, the life changes. Amen? The lifestyle changes. You're not the same person anymore. And praise God for that. You see, that power of destruction, when we were lost, it destroyed us. We were in bad shape. We could not change our condition. We were far off, according to verse 13, in our lifestyles and even in our religions. I'll tell you what, religion didn't change me. I don't know about you, but being a Methodist didn't change me at all. I never heard the gospel one time. That religion did not change my life. That religion did not do anything for me spiritually. 
until that night on June the 2nd, when I knelt down on my knees and asked Christ to be my Savior, that's what changed my life. And it changed my religion. Amen? It did. Because I got out of religion into a relationship. Amen? Amen? With Jesus Christ. That's what changed me. Being born again is exciting. Amen? Amen. It changed your whole life, your whole way of thinking. When you get into the Word, it changes you, instructs you. Amen? It's a wonderful life. You ought to be happy in Jesus Christ. Amen? If you're not, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Get into the Word. Amen? That's why it's important that you have been saved this year. You're just a new baby in Christ. You need to come to get trained. Amen? You, you, there's a lot you need to know. You need to come to my class where you're going to learn doctrine. You're going to learn how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need to know these things. This is new to you. And some of these things are going to be, you're going to think, wow, I don't understand. That's what Sunday school is all about. Amen? You need to be here. The new Converse class that I teach on Sunday morning, in the last two years, they've learned all doctrine. Justification, sanctification, redemption, all of that. Eternal security. You need to know all that. And now they're learning how to be a disciple in Jesus Christ. What it means to be a disciple. You see, there are many believers, very few disciples. Very few. You need to know what a disciple is all about, amen? So I, uh, I encourage you, those that just got saved, you need to come and get trained. Know what your faith is. Amen? amen. Can you defend your faith? I hope so. Because you're going to get challenged. They're going to come up to you and say, how come? What, what's this Jesus in your heart? What are you going to tell them? Well, what if one of those uh, Jehovah Witnesses come to your door? What are you going to tell them? I tell you what, if you're not sound in the faith, they'll, they'll twist you with doctrine. You'll go away thinking, man, I don't think I'm saved at all. I love them when they come to my door. When they do come. <laughs> they don't come to my door no more. They, they got me marked. <laughs> they, they, they got me marked. About three weeks, no, four weeks ago, I saw, oh, here they come. She, you were working. She, Do you coming? I said, yes, there's three of them. I'm ready. They hit every door except me. They came, they went right around me. And they, they must have my name at Kingdom Hall <laughs> where I live. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. But you know what? If you don't know what you believe, that's one false religion that can turn an average believer into a doctrinal pretzel. You'll break. Because you, you don't know what they believe. So, listen. Religion changed me. Man. It didn't change me, but my relationship with Christ. You see, praise God this morning. Jesus has brought us together by His grace broke down the wall. We are one in Christ. He destroyed our past. He demolished the walls of separation. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that. Look at 1 John chapter 3. In 1 John chapter 3, notice verse 14 through 16. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. And he that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that a murderer hath no eternal life abiding in him. Wherefore, whereby, hereby perceive we the love of God because he hath laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the yeah, yeah. brethren. See, the walls are broken down. Now we what? Love each other. Amen? Amen. Oh, how many religions hate each other? You ever notice that? One religion tax another religion, tax of this, that. It's all one big fight. Then when you get saved, all of a sudden you have the love of God in you. And you love everybody. We do, don't we? 
I love everybody. When I look at people, I look at people as lost. I don't see them as Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, Lutherans, Mormons, whatever you want. Name them all. I don't see them like that. I see them, they are lost, dead in their sin, and they need to get saved. You see, it's religion that puts up the what? Walls. It's religion that does that. But once in Christ, the walls are down. And we love one another. In 1 John chapter 4, turn over there. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar, and he, and he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother what? Awesome. See how much that love is? Don't let all the, the rest of the... Religion scare you with the word love? Man, Baptists love people. Amen? That's right. Amen? We do. We love them so much, we'll sacrifice our lives, we'll sacrifice our blood, we'll sacrifice our money, we'll do anything to see people saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. You want to do yourself a good rich study? Study Baptist history. We have shed more blood than any religion, name brand religion ever. We, uh, we, we've been slaughtered, beaten, murdered. Not because of the Baptist name, but because of the truth of this book. Amen. Are you willing to die for the truth of this book? I hope so. Get ready. We might be shedding some blood pretty soon. I do this Revelation series. We're on the brink of losing our religious freedom. And I'm going to tell you what. This pastor, nobody's going to take my, my freedom away. They're going to have to kill me first. I will never stop preaching the gospel. I don't care what the government says. Amen. If I have to lose my life to do it, then I'll do it. Sorry, you have to be a widow. I'm dead serious with that. The power of this destruction. Praise God, we are living a life of destruction. Everything that we did when we were not saved, the ultimate end is what? Death and hell for all eternity. But once you got saved, we were delivered from that. Amen? Amen. Set upon a solid rock, Christ Jesus. Amen. And now we have the freedom to go out and be witnesses for Jesus Christ. The power of this destruction. It was very powerful. Without Christ, aliens from Israel, strangers from the covenant promises, without hope and without God. Boy, that's destruction. Secondly, notice the place of this destruction, verse 13. <clears throat> Our past are destroyed in who? Christ. Do you see that? But now in Christ, ye were sometimes afar off, are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. But now in Christ, our pasts are destroyed in Christ Jesus. We are not liberated from the past by keeping the law. You can't keep it. Amen? Amen. See, religious people try to tell you by keeping the law, you will have eternal life. By keeping the law, you will gain heaven. Where do you find that in Scripture? Nowhere. Nowhere. You find that it condemns. What's that? You find that it condemns. Exactly. That's why God gave the law to show people they were sinners and they needed Christ. You can't keep, you can't even keep the Ten Commandments. It's impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. And if you could, you'd break the very first one, then you're thinking you're God. Right. <laughs> it's got you both ways. I challenge you, try to live the Ten Commandments and see how far you get. Not very far. Then why does religion teach that? Blows my mind. Well, just keep the Ten Commandments and you'll go to heaven. I don't think so. 
You can't keep them, man. Israel. Look at all the laws that God gave the nation of Israel, and they couldn't keep them. And that's why they needed an altar with a lamb on there to shed the blood, because they could not keep all the laws. It was impossible. We are not liberated from the past by good works. We are liberated by being in Christ. Amen? Yes. That's where it's at. In Christ. How does one come to be in Christ? Very simply by being born again. Amen? Turn with me to John 1.13. John chapter 1, in verse number 13. Well, we'll start with verse 10. He, that's Christ, was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world, what? Knew Him not. Isn't that sad? Jesus Christ, the very creator of the universe, when He came upon earth, they did not recognize the one who created them. That's sad, isn't it? That'd be like moms. That'd be like as you gave birth to your children. All of a sudden, they grow up and, and they, Mom, Mom, they go, uh, you know. I'm sorry, the opposite. They go, the mother goes to the son or the daughter and says, That's your mom. And they go, Who? I don't know you. That's exactly what happened to Jesus. He came into his own, and his own what? Received them not. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his what? What is that? What is verse 12 telling us? You ever heard this statement from the world's religions? We're all children of God. You ever heard that statement? That's false, according to verse 12. Who's the child of God? But as many as received him. Christ, being born again, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That's who are children of God. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of who? God. God. You have to be born again by God. The flesh profits nothing. The, being, you, being born in the flesh profiteth nothing. Even if you shed your own blood, it would profit nothing. We're only free in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why I said in John chapter 3. I love, I love John chapter 3. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of who? Now here's a man called Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews. In other scripture you'll see he was a Pharisee. He was a top not teacher of the law. In other words, he had his doctorate in the law of the Old Testament. In other words, he was very religious. Pharisees was a religious group. The same came to Jesus by night, scaredy cat, <laughs> and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost accept. God be with him. So he's being inquisitive, right? Notice Jesus nails him right off the bat. Jesus answered unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is going, Huh? What kind of language is this? To show you how non-spiritual this guy was, he's, he's totally thinking of the flesh. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He doesn't get it, does he? He's thinking flesh. Oh, if i got to go inside my mother's womb and be born again? Uh, like Jesus said, you must be born again. It, it went right over his head. He didn't get it. Notice what Jesus said. Verily, verily, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is 
Spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. He hits him twice with it. Nicodemus, you need to be born again from above. You need to be born again by God. Get out of your Phariseeism and get into a relationship with God. And he hits him, and he hits him between the eye again in verse 11. I'm in mean, verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not what? These things? Nicodemus should have known what Jesus was talking about. Because in the Old Testament, it talks about being born again and being saved. And he should have knew that. But he didn't, did he? All he knew was his religion. That's all he knew. See, it's not good works. It's not religion. It's being in Christ Jesus. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, and look at verse 5. Not of what? Works. works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Regeneration. Acts 16, 31. You can't be saved without the name of Jesus Christ. That's it, amen? amen? Here's the point to ponder. When we are saved by grace, we are made nigh. That is, through no effort of our own, <coughs> according to verse 13. God teared down the wall while we were yet in our sins and saved us. Praise God, amen? amen. My question to you this morning, are you in Jesus Christ? If you're not, you're lost. And Paul says you need, to be saved. you need to be saved this morning. If you are saved this morning, praise God. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. We're looking at in the discipleship class this morning. When you became born again, not only did God save your soul and your sins are totally forgiven, past, present, and future, and you have eternal life, you have a home in heaven now, but you were saved to win the lost. Amen. A disciple makes a disciple. You can't lose the vision, people. Without a vision, the people perish. I'm always going to challenge this church. We love the fellowship. We love everything we do here. But don't lose, don't lose fact. That's not our top priority. Our top priority is to see people saved. Amen. You that are saved, you should be going out, passing out trash, witnessing, and leading somebody to Christ. Amen? Amen. Just, how did you get saved? Somebody either preached to you, or you heard the message, or somebody gave you a track, and you got what? Amen. Saved. Don't you want to do that? Let somebody else have that same pleasure? Yeah. So I challenged my class to go out there and witness. Be a disciple. Tell people about Christ. Amen? Amen. If you don't, as Isaiah says, the blood will be on our hands. We are responsible to see people saved. Amen. Woe unto us when people ask us to hope that lies are in us and we don't tell them. That's a soul you're going to give an account to. So I challenge you, get out there. Don't lose the vision, Amen. We'll say, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Well, that's what my class is all about. I'll show you how to do it. Don't lose the vision. I love the fellowship. We love the worship. Amen? We love all the activity that goes on here at Beacon Baptist Fellowship. But it's all for one thing. To see people saved. That's why we're here. And when the church loses that vision, it gets stagnant. That's right. So I'm always going to challenge you. Are you in Jesus this morning? I hope you are. Notice the price of this destruction also in verse 13. <clears throat> the price was 
Who? Jesus. The blood of Jesus was the price. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary. That's the price of this destruction. I love Revelation chapter 1. Turn over there. In Revelation chapter 1, Verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, and his Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Did you know when you got saved, you became a king? <coughs> we'll get to that in Revelation when we get there. And notice verse 6, and you are also what? Priest. A priest. Did you know that? You see, I don't need a, I don't need a priest to forgive me of my sins. I'm already a <coughs> priest. You all all our priests who are saved this morning. Isn't that exciting? Mm -hmm. So you don't need a booth. You don't need some guy in a white collar. All you need is Jesus. Amen. He made you a priest. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Who would want that anyway, right? That's got to be the most boringest thing. I wouldn't want to sit in a booth and listen to people's sins all day long. <laughs> yeah, right. And I can't forgive them anyway. It's like being right. Yeah. I can't forgive them. The Bible says only Jesus Christ can forgive sins. I can't forgive sins. I don't want to listen to that all I wouldn't want to listen to that all day. I got enough problem with my own sins. Never mind somebody else's. See what religion can, you know you know why that's done? It's to take people away from Christ. From Christ. That's right. That's what it's all about. That's why this book is so wonderful. Believe what the Bible says, amen? amen. Don't believe what religion says. That's right. Anyway, isn't religion isn't religion supposed to Preach this? Supposed to. They're supposed to. I tell people all the time, if you got a religion, you go to church every Sunday morning, and they don't preach them this book, get out of that get out of that religion. Preach the word, Paul said. In season, out of season. Amen. Amen. It's the word we preach. Everything I've preached for 41 years has not been me. It's been the principles and practices of this book. Amen. Amen. This is what our church believes in, stands on, and we will never stray from it. Amen. The day we do, fire me. You got it. That's right. You said that too easy. <laughs> if you're not following that, it won't be that easy. <laughs> Amen. If that preacher's not preaching the book, he needs to be fired. Right. Right. I don't care if he's Baptist. The principle of this book. We're saved by the blood. Amen. Look at 1 Peter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. For as much as you know, you were, watch this, ye know that ye were not redeemed, that's another word meaning what? Saved with corruptible things as what? Silver, and gold? How many silver and gold statues do you see in the world's religions today? From your vain conversation received by what? Tradition. The tradition from your fathers? Tradition will kill a church. Biblical principles won't. 
but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We're saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He sacrificed His life. The price He paid so that you and I could have eternal life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to notice verse 10 through 14. Remember, the Jews had a hard time getting rid of their religious ceremonies and practices. And God said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, but by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for what? All. Did you catch that? Jesus died once for all, rose again, and ascended into heaven. Amen? Amen? So in other words, every Sunday morning, you don't crucify Him over and over and over again. Like some religions do. Many religions have them still hung on the cross, dead. Yep. You notice we don't have that? See, we got a cross. It's empty. Why? He's risen. He's, risen. He's in heaven. He's not on the cross anymore. Right. Power Amen. Power in that empty tomb. Man, I get hot, really upset when I see a cross with Jesus still hanging on it. He's not there. Don't insult God like that. And every priest standeth daily ministering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never what? Take away sins. But this man, that's Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies made his footstool. Notice his sacrifice, he did it. He went up to heaven and he what? Sat down. Praise the Lord. Finished. Amen. Amen. Now what's interesting about that verse in the Old Testament, when the priests offered up the sacrifices, they offered up thousands upon thousands upon thousands daily. And they had chairs there, but they were so busy they couldn't sit down. They were standing 24-7, seven days a week. Jesus comes along and says, I got something better. I want to sacrifice my life on a cross. I'm going to die. There's the one-time death. I'm going to rise again. Better yet, when I get to heaven, I'm going to what? Sit down. I'm going to sit down. It's over. Finished. That's why the Bible clearly states anything outside the finished work of Jesus Christ shedding His blood on Calvary is a false system of worship. Amen? Amen. That's why so many religions teach, well, you got to do something good. Good works will not save you. The work has already been done, paid for in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God for that. It's done. Finished. That's why I look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hand, which are the figures of true, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for who? Us. Us. Wow. Nor yet that he should offer himself, himself often as the high priest entereth the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Self. And as is appointed unto men once to die, but after this what? The judgment. the judgment. So you better be in Christ this morning because if you're not, there's a judgment day coming. Amen. And you'll have to look Jesus square in the eye. And you're going to have to tell him that you did not believe in him. I went by my religion. And he's going to say, depart from you. <clears throat> you work of iniquity, for I never knew you. It's a serious matter in God's sight when you try to take away the blood of Christ and the sacrifice of his son and thinking that your religion and your good works is going to get you there. That's an insult to Almighty God. 
In closing, here's the point. Jesus tore down the walls of sin and rebellion that we had built between Him and us. He reached out to us in grace and brought us near. Amen? Now it's up to us to walk in the unity God has created. This is God's will for the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, when we get to chapter 4, and I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthily of the vocation wherein you call, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But on to every one of us, he's given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So walk in that gift. Amen. God saved us, washed us in his blood. And Paul is telling this church, break down the barriers. Love one another and serve him. Amen. Amen. That's what we need to do. There's a lost and dying world out there. Let's go out and get it with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your word. Bless, Lord, the word and the invitation. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.